the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. This gospel is one of my favorites of all time. It has two beautiful things in it. Well, one, it's ugly, actually, but it's beautiful if you understand it in the other context. And then one is just amazing. The reason I became a Christian, an Orthodox Christian, was because I saw this great beauty and that I was promised that I would become free, completely free of sin. Not just forgiven of sin, but completely free of sin. So that there would be a come a day where I wouldn't have any bad thought in my head, where I wouldn't be angry or lazy or, or judge someone or anything like that. It wouldn't even occur. It wouldn't even be that I would fight it. It would be gone. That's what the next life will be like. For some, in this life it occurs. But it's very rare for people to become completely purified in this life. Certainly the mother of God was. Uh, I believe St. Seraphim Masarov was. There are a few. But all of us will be purified if we're struggling, no matter how badly we do, if we're struggling with belief and with, with repentance. In the next life, for all of us, there will be this condition of purity. Nothing in our heart that is dark. We will be free. And that's why I love this gospel, because it speaks about freedom. He says that you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, the other thing that I really love about this gospel, like I said, it's an ugly thing, it's a terrible thing, but in the other context, I always read it in the other context. He says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And then he says that, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but you seek to keep, kill me because my word hath no place in you, has no room. That's a terrible thing. Because they were so full of themselves, so full of their false doctrine, so full of their pride, their arrogance, their hatred of Rome, etc. Jesus Christ didn't fit their paradigm, so they hated him. There was no room in their heart for him. That's a terrible, ugly, horrible thing. But in the other context, the way I always read it is, if I make room, Christ will be in me. So I think that the Christian life is the process of making room. That's why I'm always talking about things like doing prostrations and saying your prayer rule and reading the Psalter, praying for others, every day, having commemorations for people every day, coming to the services, not just the, uh, you know, the last half of liturgy, but the services, all, everything you can. Uh, because what you're trying to do, reading the lives of saints, uh, of course the scriptures. So those, all those things and more, be basically everything you do in your life uh, is to make room for Christ. Now that's an amazing thing, to make room for Christ. How can we, who are so small, make room for Christ? It's like, Impossible. But with God, things that are impossible are possible. He can do them quite easily. So even though God created the universe and therefore is much bigger than us, we, he, we can contain him in our heart. All of him. The totality of it. How can that be? Well, it can be if we make room for him. And so that is, that is the way Christian life is to make room for God. Now, let's talk about this truth and freedom. There is no freedom without truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set ye free. We have now in our day, we always have, if you read the lives of the saints, you'll see it happens every day. People were martyred every day, imprisoned, tortured every day, because there were those who said something about the truth but didn't really believe it. So they believed some portion of the truth, and then their admixture of lies and they persecuted those who believed the truth. And they didn't understand that you must have truth for freedom. You must have truth to know God. It's impossible otherwise. In our age, of course, we have so many people, uh, even Orthodox people, because they don't know their faith. They don't live their faith. They're not making room for God. They wouldn't say that they're some terrible person. They wouldn't say, like, I hate God or that I'm irreligious, but they, they're not making room because there's so many other things in their life that are pushing all them and um, 
they're, they're taking up the room, the busyness of their life, and, and etc. And they're not making room. But of course, outside of the church, there's people that are saying insane things, where they're equating Christ with things that are false, and Christ with things that are blasphemous and perverse and ugly and terrible. And they, they don't make any room for Christ in their heart when they do that, because there's no truth. There must be truth. If you love someone, you must love them in the truth, according to truth. So I've made this example before. Uh, this is, you know, in context of whether or not we uh, have dare to have uh, opinions that are not according to the Rainbow Coalition in our in our country and in, our, in the world now, really. Uh, imagine you have a beloved uncle, an uncle who you used to go to his farm in, in, in the summers, and you know him dearly. And uh, he's helped raise you. And your beloved uncle starts drinking too much, becomes an alcoholic. Well, the world would say, loving your uncle is allowing your uncle to do as he wishes. But we would say loving your uncle is going to your uncle and say, uncle, I love you. You're killing yourself with this alcohol. I don't want to see you go like this. That's love and truth. Love without truth would be, well, I don't want to bother him. He'll probably get mad if I talk to him about it. I don't want to rock the boat. And after all, you know, he has a right to drink if he wants to drink. He's a boat. He's of age. That's not the truth. That's falsehood. That's what the world does. And we don't do that. We live according to truth. Now, the most important truth to apprehend is the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in our heart. Now, we can know true things. We can say the creed and believe every word of it. We can believe everything from the seven ecumenical councils, or if you don't even know about it, the, the eight ecumenical councils, or even the nine. We can do all those things, but not have the truth, because to have the truth is to have it be within us and to make us free. So if a person believes things as facts, even if they believe them fervently, but they don't act upon those facts, then they are, are dead inside. They're not alive, even though they appear to be alive. Even if they liturgize, even if they come to the services, even if they're the most important person in a parish that does all these things and is joyful and wonderful, if they don't have that truth within their heart, they're not truly Christian. Now, this is what our Lord said to the Jews, that they didn't have the truth within them. And you seek to kill me, I have told you, I have told you the truth, and you want to kill me. They didn't have the truth within them. And he said, if, if you had Father as your, uh, you don't have me as your Father, God as your Father, because you don't do the works of God. So, if we believe in God as our Father, well, we act as his children. This is fundamental Christianity that unfortunately doesn't seem to be understood. So right in the beginning of the creed, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. That is enough. If you took that little snippet, you put it on a piece of paper, put it in a bottle, sealed the bottle, and threw it in the ocean, and it came to some island where someone had been living all their life without any human contact, and of course in this little scenario they know how to read, then... They read that, that is the gospel. That's everything they need to know. Everything. Everything. Because if we believe in God as our Father, that means He created us to be like Him and to know Him. And we should act like Him, because that's what a father, a son, or a daughter does with their father. They act like their father. They become like their father. Of course, we're talking about a good father. In earthly uh, circumstances, sometimes that's not true. But in the case of God, he is always a good father. And so if he is our father, we are to act as his sons and his daughters. And if we act as his sons and his daughters, then we are not only knowing the truth in that we can speak it out, but we are knowing the truth in that we know it experientially because we're living the truth. We are becoming the truth. Now, the Jews were so delirious, so delusional, that they literally said to him after he said, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Instead of getting down on the ground and saying, 
I beg thee, O Lord, help me to know this truth. Like the, the Samaritan woman, she said what? When the Lord said, I can give you living water, he says, uh, give me this water. And then, of course, he exposed her as an adulterous and a, a five-time married person. And she didn't go away. She, she, knew, she, she knew he was a prophet. And then she wanted to hear more because she wanted that living water. She wanted the truth. Of course, the living water is the Holy Spirit, which brings us the truth. So these Jews, instead of begging him, getting on the ground and saying, help us, Lord, to, to, to be free, they, not knowing that they were not free, being full of arrogance, pride, deceit, they said, we are Abraham's seed, we have never been in bondage to any man. They were saying this in Jerusalem, or perhaps they were saying it, I think this was in Jerusalem that this, this uh, conversation occurred which was under Rome. They were in complete bondage to Rome. Now, some of the richer Jews, they had all kinds of privileges because of they, they had working relationships with the Roman occupiers, and they were rich beyond belief. And so they separated themselves from the regular rabble. Those people were not free, but they felt themselves to be free, when actually they were even more enslaved because of their lusts and their... Uh, avarice and their murderous intents to say that they're not under bondage to any man. We're under bondage to man. And that man, if you want to see who it is, go into the bathroom and look in the mirror. That's the person you're in bondage to. You're in bondage to that sinner, that person who does sin and is not free because the Lord says that. He says that when you sin, you're not free. He who sins is a slave of sin. So when you look in that mirror, look at a slave. A slave to sin. But becoming a free man. Becoming a true human being. Because we have the Holy Spirit abiding in us. So we're not completely a slave to sin. And certainly if we are not arrogant and say we're not in bondage, then the Lord recognizes our humility and our begging Him to help us. And He will help us, always. A, a compunctionate prayer with humility, God will always answer. So if you're saying, I'm in bondage to my sins, I can't seem to stop thinking badly about people. I can't seem to stop being uh, full of arrogance. I can't seem to stop cussing. I can't seem to stop having uh, bad sexual thoughts, etc., etc. Well, you admit those things to God. And you say, I'm in bondage to them, but I want to be free. And the truth sets you completely free. See, in the, in the West, really in the world now, the truth is a, is a concept. The truth is not a concept. Jesus Christ said he is the truth. So the truth is a person. And concepts are things that you can think about or talk about or debate about in a kind of a passive way. You could be sitting on the couch, you know, smoking a pipe and having a scotch and talking about truth. That does nothing at all because Jesus Christ is truth. So to know the truth, we have to know Jesus Christ. That's why the Christian life is full of asceticism, which the world hates. Even in orthodoxy, so many people hate it. I thank God that God has preserved in our church monasticism, the only church in Christendom, if you can call it that, where the church is pres preserved monasticism. Monasticism is very strong. Now, it's weak in some quarters in the church. But in general, it's very strong. We take our marching orders from monks. There's even a saying that angels are the light of monks and monks are the light of the lay people or the faithful. So we take our... The way we live is very much based upon the rigorous lifestyle of monasticism. No, we're not wearing hair shirts and staying up all night and suspending our arms by ropes so that we can pray without going to sleep and all those sorts of things. We're not fasting as rigorously as the monks, although similar to them. All those things. The, the, the difference in lifestyle is, is profound. But the purpose of the lifestyle is identical. And that is to have the truth set us free. And it's really tragic. This In this gospel, it reminds me very much of the Gergesenes. When the Lord healed those two demon, demonized men. They were so demonized that they were laying, 
living naked in the tombs, place of uh, an abode of demons, and where they would gnash themselves with uh, rocks and cut themselves, scream and rant and rave. Nobody could go near them. They were ostracized by, by their own people. And then they were cured. But in doing the, the cure, the Lord sent those demons into the pigs, and the pigs were all drowned in the, in the Sea of Galilee. And the pigs were a mighty business, a black market business for these Jews who would sell them to the pagans around Galilee, but also, I'm sure, eat a little bit themselves. And they came out to the Lord and said, leave us, because they saw his power and they were afraid of him. There was the truth, which would set them free. They could have gotten on their knees and say, forgive us that we have broken the law and help us to find a way to follow you. But no, indeed, they just said, go away. And he did. And these Jews, although they didn't per se tell him to go away, they plotted to kill him. And they had the truth right there, standing before them, speaking to them. The Lord Jesus Christ, the truth, right before them, telling them what was wrong with them. All they needed to do is admit that they were slaves to sin, and then he would commence the process of breaking that enslavement through the process of living, repentance, falling down, getting up, admitting our faults, and becoming better. They had it right before them, and they rejected him, and even plotted to kill him because of his words. He told them, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. These are the ones who said they were free. They were not in bondage to any man. Well, just think if uh, they should think about what would happen if they stopped paying tribute to Rome, how, how free they would be. They wouldn't be very free at all. They'd be dead or they'd be in prison. And they didn't understand that they were absolutely in bondage to their sins. And they didn't understand what the true freedom would be. Most people think of freedom as that I can do as I please. I can do whatever I want. I have enough money that I don't have to worry about my health or housing. I can go on vacations. I'm free. And no one can tell me what to do. I'm free. That's not the Christian's conception of freedom at all. And all those things are irrelevant to a Christian. If you have them, well, okay, fine. If you don't, it doesn't matter. What matters is freedom is to have Christ in the heart. And when you have Christ in the heart, you shall be free indeed. It's the freedom that is incomprehensible to us. We know it can happen. We know it will happen. But we only experience it a little bit fleetingly. Maybe we conquer some sin. You know, maybe we used to cuss, and we don't cuss anymore. Maybe we used to use drugs, and we don't use drugs anymore. Maybe we're kinder than when we were a youth, etc., etc. But when we look at overall our life, there's so much that's still wrong. There's so much that's still black in it. But the truth will set you free, and you will be free indeed. That is the promise of Christianity. And it's not just some sort of hypothetical promise. It's lived out every day. Because if you are reading the lives of the saints, reading the scriptures, doing the prostrations, doing the work, doing the asceticism, if you are keeping your mouth shut when somebody speaks who's really just irritates you, and all those other things in your day-to-day life, both big and small, both formal and informal. By formal, I mean things like you're going to have a prayer rule, etc. You're going to read the Bible every day, etc. The informal things is you encounter someone and they're arrogant and you don't lash out at them. Or someone is unfair to you and you don't complain. Those sorts of things. If you do all those sorts of things, then stepwise, you become free. You become completely free. That's Christianity. We have a very low view of Christianity, even within the church. And especially outside of monasteries, and even monasteries are affected by this, unfortunately, now. You read things from the lives of the saints about monasteries, and there's no monastery like that anymore. Where people are living with such asceticism that you would think that it would be 
most people would consider to be mental illness, the kind of asceticism that people lived with in the monastery. But especially in the churches and in the parishes, there's so little asceticism. There's so little. There's so little compunction. But we need to provide that compunction. If we're one of a hundred, and we in some way are prostrating ourselves before Christ and saying, save me, help me not to be uh, so idiotic and enslaved to sin, then the grace of God will be permeating the entire place. You know, the Lord said, acquire the spirit of peace and a thousand around you. Excuse me, St. Seraphim. Well, he was inspired by the Lord to say it, wasn't he? St. Seraphim said, if you acquire the spirit of peace, a thousand around you will be saved. So it's, it's up to you, it's up to me, to live a life according to truth, to not listen to the world telling us what truth is. They have no idea. I have a rule. Um, maybe this sounds vaguely political, and it certainly applies to politics. If it's the narrative, it's false. If it's what the world says, as a consensus, it's false. So you need to find a consensus of the church. And you find that by exposing yourself as much as you can to the scriptures, especially reading the Psalter and the Gospels, reading the lives of the saints, and learning what real, what truth is. Or who truth is, I should say, right? Because truth is a person. So this Gospel is wonderful. We could literally do a study on this Gospel for, for five days. Because it has so many things in it, many, many things. I've only glossed on the surface. But the most important parts of this gospel are that if we know the truth, the truth makes us free, and we will be free indeed. So we should pursue this truth with every ounce of our being, with every fiber of our body, that we should pursue this truth. And in pursuing this truth, we are making room for God in our heart. So I think you should think maybe in a sort of crude mathematical way. You know, if you have a pitcher and it holds two quarts and it's filled with two quarts of water, you cannot add any more water to it. But let's say you want to uh, put fine wine in this pitcher and it's filled with water. You must be rid of the water first in order to put the wine in. So if there's something in your heart that's dark, that part of your heart cannot have God. There's no room for God. Now, of course, God can do anything he wishes, but he will not force himself in your heart. You must invite him, and that invitation is not a once, one-time thing. Like, come into my heart. Okay, now I can go on with living my life, doing whatever I want. No. That invitation is, is a moment-by-moment, breath-by-breath thing to be inviting Christ and the Holy Trinity into your heart and by struggling to make room for him. So yes, indeed, the Orthodox Church, the Christian life, way of life, is ascetical. It does include self-denial. Anyone who will, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You must deny yourself in order to be saved. There are no uh, salvations where a person is sitting uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a lawn chair, having people feed them grapes with somebody uh, fanning them and having you know, umbrella drinks. That doesn't happen. There is no salvation without labor. The greatest lie of, I think, the, the Christian period, from the beginning of the, of the church to now, the greatest lie is that you can have salvation without labor. I think that has caused more people to lose their way. And of course, that's a typical Protestant heresy, the idea of salvation by only faith. And their faith does not imply asceticism and works and, and struggle and and making room for God. They arrogantly think, I've made room for God by saying a prayer. That is a terrible thing, to have that delusion. That's a great delusion, and it is still infects Orthodox people, because I, I, I hear from people all the time that say crazy things, like, well, I don't fast, because that's, that's something monks do. Or, no, I don't, I don't fast the apostles fast, well, because, well, that's not a custom in our church. Monks do that. Or, uh, you know, I don't... We just had liturgy on, on Sunday. I, I don't want to... I'm tired. I can't go on Wednesday also. Or for Pascha, like, you know, Pascha's a big celebration. Everybody loves it, and then they don't show up for a couple weeks because they're resting. Well, let me tell you, I'm tired too. 
but I'm actually less tired when I'm celebrating the liturgy than when I'm not. So you have to have an ascetical lifestyle that is denying yourself, making room for Christ, and then God will help you in everything. And then you'll be free. Now there's one more thing in this little meandering little sermon I'm giving that if you don't recognize that you're not free, how are you going to become free? Most of the world, they don't recognize they're not free. They see things that are aberrations and they consider them to be normal. I was speaking with somebody in a entire context about nutrition and our nutrition in this country is horrendous, just horrendous. The things people eat uh, continually, every day, and they have leaky gut syndrome and all kinds of diseases and all kinds of problems because their food is toxic. And they don't recognize that's a problem because everybody's got the problem. Everybody's got the sniffles and everybody gets sick and and, uh, everybody complains about being sore and uh, blah, 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 because the, the food is so toxic for everybody. They don't see the normal. That is the normal for them. So people who live in a worldly way, they don't see that, that the way they live is not normal. I think a lot of us, by a textbook, by the DSM manual, which is a diagnostic manual for psychiatry, we would, none of us would be considered to be mentally ill, but we are. Any Christian understands that he's ill. He doesn't look at whatever the world says is normal. We're not normal yet. Because we're not like Christ. So we know that we need the truth to set us free because we know we're not free. We know that. But we're becoming free. And it's a glorious thing to be free. And we will be free. Christ is risen. He is risen.